Hallo miteinander, I'm Geschädi6 and this is Toho Kokushin. Last time we did some pest control in the bamboo forest. Another point of interest for us now is the Genbu Ravine. What pointed us in this direction was another newspaper article claiming that a monstrous snake had been sealed away here a long time ago. Hopefully this won't be another big letdown. The spirits of the forest from last time turned out to be only misconceived mumbo jumbo. Luck already seems to be on our side, giving us a sapphire. We're going to swiftly equip that one, because as said last time, sapphires are always better than amethysts. No need to compare anything here. So, the Genbu Ravine. For the longest time, I thought this was Toho Ten Mountain of Faith's third stage, but that is not quite correct. That would be the Untrodden Valley. The Genbu Ravine first appeared in Toho 10.5 Scout Weather Rhapsody, and it is where the Kuki Kappa inventor Nitori Kawashiro resides. This is indeed a place where you would think you might meet a kappa. On that note, a pretty common thing in Toho fan games is that mythical Japanese monsters that the characters are modeled after are used as normal enemies. Ankake Spa did not put any random kappa in this game. Perhaps they just find them too yucky, they are meant to be pretty gross, you know. But we might still meet Nitori. Whoever it is that dares to stand in our way, they better watch out for this spell card. That is the one we learned in the previous episode, Illusion Sign Killing Doll. It is really effective against large groups of enemies. Now let's do a bit of a cut here, I wanted to save you a few seconds. Not only did we equip that Star Sapphire, it is always better than a normal Sapphire, but we are also using that skill we learned just now, Serial Killer Maid. We've exchanged Knife Throw for it, a skill that we've been using pretty excessively, so I hope you'll welcome the change. And that right there is it, the big flurry of knives. One advantage this skill has over the simple knife throw is that it has a much further spread and is therefore more accurate. Of course, no skill is meant to completely obsolete another in this game, so there are downsides to it. For once, it is more expensive, taking away two skill diamonds per use, and it is also more committing you could call it. It has a much longer attack animation, costing you more time and mobility. So yeah, Serial Killer Maid is not all sunshine, although it never makes you completely static. As we can see here, you can still move around a little while the attack is underway. It's a good feature. It helps you adjust your aim and if you're lucky, you may still be able to evade an incoming enemy attack. So much for that skill. We only talked very briefly about Killing Doll, but it is great. You can simply jump headfirst into a bulk of enemies and just flatten them. It covers almost the entire screen, maybe not the very edges. For a spell card, however, it is somewhat weak. Sure, the majority of normal enemies will still succumb to it, but a boss killer, it is not. Inscribed Red Soul is still way more powerful and by no means made useless for us. We paused the game again just to equip that white headband. That is the next better type of armor after aprons, and they will just always have more hit points on them. We really need that extra health, it can make the difference between life and death, especially because the Genbu Ravine can be a pretty dangerous place. I know that might not seem so apparent right now, we've fought monster groups of these sizes before but their level was never this high. Yes, enemies level up as we go through the game. So technically, these mushrooms we're fighting are not the same ones we've faced before. Well, we need to pause the game again because that headdress is a very rare find and just too good not to put on. It's well worth those 5 seconds or whatever that was. But we were talking about monster levels. Whenever you hit an enemy, a health bar will pop up and right next to it is a number. That is their monster level. Around this area, they are all level 10, just like us right now. Well, not anymore. The higher an enemy's level, the more health they'll have, the more damage they'll do, and the better spoils we'll get from them. 
So yeah, because of this mechanic, even simple foes like fairies stay relevant. Of course, a fairy will always be really darn weak in comparison to anything else, but imagine a level 1 fairy. She wouldn't even matter anymore now. All those enemies on the ground down below, they can wait. We are taking the high route right now. But is it the right way to go? Well, that's the fun of the Genbu Ravine. It is so thrillingly complex. And the minimap should reflect that right now. You know, this stage may not be all that distinguishable visually, it's pretty much just open plains with a river running around them. It feels a little too much alike the intro stage, which was a lakeside area. But what is so excellent about the Genbu Ravine is the freedom that its stage design gives. First of all, this section has two exits, one of them we have already found in the top right corner of the map, but we didn't go into it. That's because we want to spend a little bit more time exploring around here. All in all, the area is pretty vast and wide open, and with the multiple exits, you're always in a position of choosing your route. That's pretty cool, I find. I've noticed that players don't really appreciate it if levels are too much like corridors with some alibi forks in them. May I say, final hallway 13. I think I may. Luckily, this stage isn't at all like that. It's a lot of fun to explore, especially on your first time playing. It'll be an adventure of Scarlet Curiosity. Neat knife dispenser. We're going to see that skill in action soon. Very soon. So, as I just said, this stage is pretty complex, but not in a confusing manner. It has a clear structure to it. In my head, I can always divide it into a west and an east wing. Let's ignore for now that an outdoors place can't really have wings like an architecture, shall we? Good. The border between these two wings is pretty much where we are right now. Upon starting the episode, we instantly shot for the east wing. That one is a lot more chambery in its layout, and it also holds a lot more treasure chests. Which is why we come through it pretty thoroughly. The west wing, on the other hand, is where the river flows. It's got a lot of bridges that will lead you over, making it a bit more linear, and there are also noticeably less items to collect in it. That's a shame, nonetheless, we are going to check it out because honestly, it's really pretty looking. We already had the chance to just skip all of that and leave this section behind us, but there is so much to see. So many dangers waiting for us. Yeah, what we're doing is a little bit risky, we've already lost quite a bit of our health. That brings us to our next subject, the health system of this game. That's something that I should have talked about much earlier, but didn't. Better late than never, right? Anyway, next to our level in the lower left are two numbers, reading 337-676 right now. That's our current and maximum health. So we're a little more than half dead right now. Not to worry though, under the center vase here is a full refill. You might have noticed that health pickups are pretty plentiful in this game. The small ones sure are, not so much the ones that give everything back. Small refills, by the way, always regenerate a third of your total. That they're so commonly found is pretty considerate of the game. Some people even say that it's too generous and spoiling them, and that is valid to a degree. On the other hand, some games give you too few chances to heal over too long a distance you have to cover, which beats you more by attrition than anything else. It's really hard to say what is and isn't a right way to achieve difficulty, so let's not go on a tangent that massive right now. There's not much else to know about the health system of this game, it's pretty standard, but it is displayed in a strange manner. Below the numbers is another bar, that is also our health, only shown graphically. So yes, our interface shows the same thing twice. I appreciate that. No, really, I do. It's pretty smart if you think about how the human brain works. Some older RPGs often only use one way to describe your health situation. 
for example Secret of Mana or, as a related game, Secret of Evermore. They only use numbers for that. That's best if you want to accurately calculate how many more hits you can take. But if you need to quickly know the rough condition you're in, your brain can just process a health bar's information much faster than that of a number. So much for your daily dose of neuroscience. Just a little disclaimer, I am not a doctor. Don't quote me, you will get an F on those papers, just saying. We've gotten all the treasure chests that we wanted, so we can finally go where we need to go. There would have been another chest that we didn't get, but could've. It's in the very lower left corner of the map, but getting it from this side is impossible. It is blocked off by a wall. To get it, we would've had to encircle the whole area back to the start and then head westward. And that is just really not worth it in my opinion. Of course, we could've gotten it at the very start, but still, it's so isolated. Getting it would've meant substantially more backtracking. And let's face it, every item we get now will be replaced at some point. There are still so many upgrades. Oho, cleaning maid! That is one of my favorite skills Sakuya has. It's a very comical one too. We're going to save it for a rainy day. Look forward to it. We are getting closer and closer to the second exit. It's in the very top left corner of the map. There is no real reason we prefer it over the other one. You can take that one if you want. It's just easier to reach from here. Both of these exits are about equally well guarded by guards that will cower in fear from our killing doll. Nice. There is another disadvantage that comes with killing doll, but it's a very minor one. It has a very long attack animation, meaning that a lot of time passes until the first knives you spawn hit the enemies. You're invincible from the moment you hit the button, so that's not where the problem lies. It's that your combo counter may reset while you wait on killing doll. Yes, that is a possibility. It's not all that likely, but it's happened to me before. Not landing a hit for a long enough time is one of the reasons why your combo counter may reset. As I said, it's not too significant a disadvantage of the move, but just keep it in mind. Alright, up ahead is a red marking on the minimap. That is where the entrance to the caves lies. What terrors are waiting for us in there? Well, it's not actually looking too bad so far. It's not pitch black darkness at least. Instead, it's got this nice luminescence to it. I think it's supposed to come from these crystals you see from time to time. I like it. Know what I don't like? These damn red frogs. I'm not at all ashamed to have used a spell card there, because those red frogs are nasty. They are very fast, far faster than their green counterparts, and they are just notorious for getting a quick cheap hit in while you're otherwise occupied. Over here in this little nook is another treasure chest waiting to be discovered. Hunter knives, or their improvement full tank hunter knives, have somewhat typical stats. They're pretty much always better than deck brushes, but not necessarily better than our Damascus knife we got last episode. That one by the way also has a lot of item drop rate on it, and as you know, that is very desirable to have during any stage portions. Not on bosses though, bosses don't drop anything. You know, for the longest time, this stage seemed so familiar to me, and I was right. It is visually very close to the second stage of Yoyo Kengeki Muso, this game's predecessor. More accurately, you would have to call Toho Kokishin a spin-off, but that's besides the point. Both the outside and the cave areas of these two stages seem very similar, but aren't in stage design. Don't worry, no one's been lazy. It's not a complete rehash of Kengeki's Swamp of the Northern God. Not even sure if that name is from the Toho lore. Never heard of it, didn't find anything about it, but that's not important. What's important is that those two stages are not the same. There's something else to know about this cave system. Depending on which of the two exits you chose out of the previous area, you will start on one of the two sides. We took the western side, which does resemble the eastern one, but they're still unique, not mirrored or anything. 
Also, both of them meet up just around here. Yes, this flooded part you will see, no matter which route you've chosen for yourself. This is also a spot where I like triggering my spell card. I very much recommend it, as there are a lot of these resilient mushrooms bundled all close together. If you're worried about killing doll not hitting enemies on slightly higher ground, don't be. It doesn't care about small differences like these. Unfortunately, I used up our spell card in a spot where I did really have to, so we don't have any right now. Kind of sucks, I know, but there's worse. Accidents happen. And that would be the number one sentence you don't ever want to hear from your surgeon. We can now leave the caves behind and proceed to the final section of the stage, which is little more than the boss fight itself. We're going to update our equipment off-screen right here, for once putting on that full tank hunter knife we found earlier. We'll also be adapting our skills, using inscribed red soul for its damage again. You will also finally see time paradox. Now let us face Star Sapphire. You want to talk? Talk to the hand. No, not that Star Sapphire. The one we are up against is a lot less menacing. I think. I mean, we could start a silly crossover power level discussion here. Let's not. Let's not. Star here is another member of the three mischievous fairies, and arguably the smartest of them, or at least the most sensible. As sensible as you can expect a fairy to be. She is still very foolish objectively. Her cleverness is what usually keeps her out of trouble from her pranks, but I think her luck has run out. This is no prank. This is a battle, one-on-one, -on -one, no tricks. Compared to her comrade Luna, Star is a noticeable step up. Her shots tend to spread pretty far apart, and that keeps you on the move. Ranged attacks like our equally far-spreading knife dispenser help, but from time to time, good opportunities to get in close will present themselves. All in all, it's not too tough a fight. Let's summarize it like this. If you did alright against Riggle, you're not gonna break much of a sweat here as well. And that's another fight in the bag. But we didn't come here looking to beat up fairies, now did we? No, we were searching for a monstrous snake. Did Sakuya just forget about her objective, or did we not find anything and just give up? Whatever is the case, we are thrown out of Genbu Ravine, but not empty-handed. We have mugged a curious key from Star. A key that may become very important some other time. When we resume our quest, we will look for eyewitnesses first. I'm Gashedi6, this was Toho Kokishin, and next time we will meet so many humans in the human village, because that's what it's called after, right? Bis bald!